This is the operator from Global Crossing. The training has now begun and all participants have been placed on mute. You will remain muted until the question and answer period during the last 15 minutes of the seminar. Kelly Muskoke at Curry International Tuberculosis Center will be coordinating today's seminar. Kelly? Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Kelly Musoke. I'm a program manager here at the Curry Center, and I'm here with Bob Fiedelkron, who's our distance learning coordinator, and he's going to be helping with today's course. We have about 1,100 participants registered for this training from across the United States, and you should be able to see a seating chart on the lower left-hand corner of your screen, where each square represents an individual or a group that has logged in. Today's session is being recorded, and we plan to post those recordings on our website in the near future for your use. So you have all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording. And for this reason, we ask that you reserve all questions and comments for the Q&A period, which will take place after all of the presentations. The Curry International TB Center is one of four regional tuberculosis training and medical consultation centers in the country. These centers are often referred to as RTMCCs. The Curry Center covers jurisdictions in the western region that include the following locations. The project was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Cooperative Agreement and is a collaborative project of the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the University of California, San Francisco. To get a better idea of how many individuals and groups are currently online, please go ahead and vote to let us know who is sitting in with you. Okay, great. Thank you. It looks like the majority so far are either individuals or in groups of two to five. So great. Welcome to have you all. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all of the members of the course planning committee who are involved in the development of today's training. Several of them are going to be presenting to you today. And thank you all for your contributions. The center is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The center is also approved as a provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This web-based seminar is approved for a total of two continuing education contact hours. To receive your continuing education contact hours, you must have logged into the seminar or signed the attendance sheet and complete the online evaluation. The website for the evaluation will be emailed to all registered course participants immediately following the training. And all of today's faculty members have signed a declaration of disclosure. Today we are using Global Crossing's live meeting software for our training. For technical assistance during our workshops, please call this 888 number. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's facilitator, Dr. Lisa Chen. Dr. Chen is the medical director at CITC and also works in the pulmonary and critical care division at UCSF. Lisa? Great. Thank you, Kelly. Well, I'd like to welcome those of you listening today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, I, whoops. Are we, we switched off our slides here. Uh, so um, in a minute, you'll see the objectives for this course, but I really want to acknowledge that the idea of bringing you a webinar focused on some of the differential diagnosis dilemmas we face in TV work came from our Curry Center's Regional Advisory Committee, particularly uh, folks like the California State TV Controller, Jenny Flood, if you're listening, thank you, and others who decided that this was something important for, um, for folks in our region to hear about. We um, were working on trying to get our slides back in the order that they should be, but, but <laughs> so I'll keep talking. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. This is Kelly. I just want to chime in for a moment. It, it seems that actually somebody else is advancing the slides, and I don't know who that could be. So if, if anyone is advancing the slides, if you could please um, refrain from that. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to get back on track, and the mystery uh, clicker <laughs> is still going at it. But we all know that TB is really the great imposter. It presents in a multitude of guises. 
And the ongoing challenge for all of us who work with TV is to really figure out who among the TV suspects do we need to really think beyond TV. And so that's really the genesis of this uh, differential diagnosis webinar. Uh, the possibilities that we have to think about are broad, but in this short two hours, we really want to cover some of the classic examples of dilemmas that we face via the three cases that our uh, expert panel of TV docs will present. Um, if I had the slide that showed the names of it, I, I could tell you who's who's on this line. But I, I, without you being able to see it, let me just tell you. Um, case number one will be covered by Gisela Schechter, uh, who is the position liaison at the California State TB Control Branch. She's also an associate clinical professor of medicine uh, in the infectious disease department at UCSF here in San Francisco. Our second case will be Phil Hopewell, who's the principal investigator here at Curry Center and is also one of the professors in our division of pulmonary and critical care medicine. The final case, we're going to go up to Oregon. Kevin Winthrop is an assistant professor there in the um, Oregon School of Medicine, and he is also a consultant at the State of Oregon Public Health Division and the TB Control Program. Uh, I think we're still working on trying to figure out who and where uh, the control of the device has gone to, but um, so I think, Gisela, you're on deck, and those of you hanging on the line holding, watching these slides flash in front of you, uh, I hope you bear with us through this. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we, Lisa, if we haven't all had a, a, an epileptic seizure yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the, the one of the key things that we always say in, in, in training and education is we always have to be ready for Plan B. And certainly the kinds of uh, things that we have to discuss are things that um, we can just, you know, use what you'd like. Um, we could... Yeah. We could maybe start to dive into the clinical parameters of your case. Um, okay. I think um, we said, and we're working on whatever the technical issue may be, and I just want to reiterate that almost all the participants should have the slides printed as well, so they can follow in order. Okay. So, <laughs> Gisela, why don't, why don't we just hear about your case. We'll, we'll be very old school about this. This is like presentation rounds in the hospital. <laughs> so, so, so tell us about uh, how your case presented first. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you also for inviting me to participate in this webinar because I think this is a, a, a very, very important topic because we all think TB, but we also sometimes have to think, well, if it's not TB, what is it? Um, so the first case that I wanted to present um, is a 26-year-old African-American man. He was born and raised in our own Bay Area here of California. Um, unfortunately, uh, he was convicted of cocaine trafficking about six months prior to his presentation and uh, was sent to serve a sentence in Kern County, California. That's in the Central Valley of California, um, which is uh, important as, a, as the history will unfold. Um, he did have a history of heavy alcohol use with some liver problems. He's used some marijuana. He denied any intravenous drug use. Um, he, however, um, was a gay man and had had sex with men. He, okay, there we go. He presented to his prison clinic at the end of November in 2009, complaining of four weeks of cough, weight loss of about 20 pounds over that same four-week period, diarrhea, shortness of breath for a couple of weeks, and maybe some slow mentation. He had a fever for only about a day. Um, with this presentation, that he was immediately hospitalized. And, um, you know, given his history and the presentation, uh, I'm going to ask Phil to chime in. What would your first thoughts be uh, regarding this patient? What, what would you be thinking about? Well, the, the differential diagnosis uh, in this man is, is really quite broad at this point. Uh, the two features of his history that are striking are, first of all, that 
is certainly at risk of having HIV, and we don't know what his HIV status is, that raises the whole spectrum of opportunistic diseases that occur with uh, HIV. Uh, the second is that he was transported from the Bay Area to Kern County, which is sort of the epicenter of uh, uh, Coxie country in, uh, in California. And so um, I think high on my list would be uh, coccidioidomycosis, whether he's HIV infected or not. Uh, the subacute nature of this presentation makes it uh, a little unusual and, uh, again, would uh, raise the possibility of HIV-associated infections such as PCP, but also uh, tuberculosis, which is clearly a, a prominent part of the differential diagnosis. Thanks a lot. And uh, would community-acquired pneumonia fit into this at all? Not really. Uh, this is, I mean, there are some community-acquired pneumonias that are more indolent, but generally they're much more acute in, uh, in their presentation. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, at this point, you know, we have a number of different potential diagnoses. I don't know if I can go back. Do I dare go back to uh, <laughs> where, uh, no, I, that was a mistake. Um, okay. So, uh, thanks a lot, Phil. I think at this point I was going to ask, I had a slide up that said, what's the most likely diagnosis? And we took down mycobacterial, viral, bacterial, fungal um, uh, agents. Then uh, uh, you've already covered what, what you thought might be a most likely diagnosis. I think TB has to be high on the list. Um, Kevin, I think you might want to chime in about whether NTMs might be an issue here. Yeah, is it is it possible to get to the the chest X-ray or? I hope so. It, it seems as if these slides are going um, automatically. Uh, I don't know if you have control of Vizsla at all. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think we covered for what's been presented so far. I mean, I okay. think we've covered it, and certainly it's it's a broad differential diagnosis at this time. Thank, okay. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Basically, this then the physical exam was done, and he turned out to be a thin gentleman in moderate respiratory distress. He did have a fever. The temperature was 102 degrees. He had an elevated pulse. His respiratory rate was 24. Blood pressure was low normal, 101 over 71, with an O2 saturation of 95%. His lungs were clear to auscultation. He did have an enlarged liver. And I think you just saw that chest x-ray right there because they very appropriately, um, on his presentation, um, obtained a chest x-ray. And if we can have that, um, Bill, I don't know if you wanted to uh, comment on what you see on this x-ray. We finally have it. Yeah. So um, there are two prominent features. One is that there's evidence of a left pleural effusion, a moderate-sized left pleural effusion. But uh, more impressively, there's a diffuse uh, uh, pattern, finely nodular pattern, that would qualify as miliary, meaning um, fine nodules that are less than two millimeters in diameter. That is about the size of a millet seed. So uh, I, I don't see uh, intrathoracic adenopathy. Um, and now we see a, a close-up view that shows the miliary pattern much more clearly. Um, so diffuse, uh, finely nodular uh, uh, pattern of opacities. Thanks a lot, Bill. So we have this gentleman with a subacute presentation, miliary changes on, on chest x-ray. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, I'm afraid to touch it myself. Um, great. <laughs> Diagnostic studies then were, of course, done. Slightly low albumin and slightly elevated AST and ALTs, um, along with alkaline phosphatase. Now, that could be his current illness, or it could also be some underlying liver disease from his alcoholism. Um, some moderate uh, anemia and a slightly low white cell count. Uh, same with the platelets. He did have an HIV antibody test, and it was, in fact, negative. Uh, sputum was not collected. The patient went directly to a bronchoalveolar lavage, um, and, and the studies on that were not that helpful. Uh, the AFB was smear negative. The culture, of course, is pending. The fungal stains were negative. 
um, a stain for PCT was also negative. Next slide. So at this point, we, we've already done a bronchoscopy. It hasn't been that revealing. Uh, stains were negative. Uh, what do you think now with this picture on x-ray? What would you think is the most likely diagnosis at this point, Kevin? Well, uh, thanks, Gisela. You know, with a, a disseminated type picture on the x-ray, the milia, I mean, certainly you, you worry about, in a gentleman from um, the Central Valley, California, you're going to worry about coccidioid mycosis. He has TB risk factors. You're going to worry about TB. I mean, while the differential is uh, still somewhat wide, it's much narrower now with that x-ray. I think coxie and TB would be high on my list. Um, you know, non tuberculous mycobacterium really doesn't present like this. Uh, viral causes, I don't think much of in this case. There's certainly non-infectious causes that uh, could be cause, uh, could be causal here. Um, you know, one thing to think about too is fairly rare, but uh, in old guys, particularly who uh, receive uh, intravesicular BCG um, installations for their bladder cancers, they can sometimes disseminate and show up with miliary. Uh, BCG uh, in their lungs, so that would be in the differential if the person had that type of history. And really, depending on where you are in the country, if you're elsewhere, you know, other endemic uh, mycoses would be uh, to be considered, such as histo and blasto, et cetera. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kevin, and thanks for bringing up the BCG because I've had a case like that as well. Okay, um, as a pulmonologist, Phil, um, what about non infectious possibilities? Well, there are non-infectious processes that, that can cause a miliary pattern on, on chest film. Uh, these would include uh, metastatic cancer. Uh, a variety of, of uh, neoplasms can present with this kind of finely nodular uh, pattern of opacities. In the example shown here, it's metastatic uh, thyroid uh, cancer. Uh, the other example shown in uh, this group of three uh, chest radiographs is talc granulomatosis that occurs in people who use intravenous drugs uh, that are uh, often cut with uh, material that contains talc. And uh, again, you see this characteristic finely nodular or miliary pattern uh, distributed diffusely throughout all lung zones. Thanks, Bill. So, as, as you've heard, the differential diagnosis of miliary chest x-ray findings is quite broad. Um, Any time you see that finding, you, know, you at least have to consider the diagnosis of tuberculosis. But again, sarcoidosis, we haven't mentioned yet, um, can also produce this picture, although it's not characteristic of it. Fungal diseases, um, in, in this setting, Coxy has been brought up as a, as a prominent um, candidate. Uh, other parts of the country, cytoplasmosis, blastomycosis, cryptococcosis, and then the pneumoconiosis, etc., cetera, um, and carcinomatosis, lymphoma, as has been mentioned. Um, in some cases, of course, a biopsy may be needed to make some of these diagnoses. Um, and a little bit later on, I'll be talking about, well, you do the biopsy, your stains are still negative, but you get granulo granulomatous changes. What do you do then? But can I have the next slide? Well, here you are now. We're back to our case. Uh, you've heard what his symptoms are. You've seen his chest x-ray. Um, you don't have a definitive diagnosis on the stains that have been done. I'd like to get some audience participation here. Um, who would begin empiric treatment for this gentleman now? He's quite ill. Um, and with what agent? The polls are open. Okay. If, if there are a thousand people, there's a lot of people more who need to weigh in. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to close the polls and reveal the results here. Oops. Um, okay, I think they show now. So the, a, a small majority would say a four-drug anti-TB treatment plus A or B, as antifungal treatment or antibacterial treatment as empiric treatment. Um, so I think, you know, people are thinking, well, this is, the TB is a, is a very real possibility, but there's also uh, the possibility that um, this could be something else. 
um, about a quarter of you would only treat for TB, and then a small number are going to say no, no um, empiric treatment at all. But let me tell you what happened. Well, the hospital diagnosis at that point was a working diagnosis. Um, he actually went on and required mechanical ventilation for ARDS and rule out miliary TB. He was placed on steroids. He was treated with what some of you recommended, which was broad-spectrum antibiotics plus standard four drug medications for tuberculosis. And uh, several days later, he was discharged, improved. However, um, the patient didn't continue to do better. He felt worse. He complained of more shortness of breath and the recurrence of fever. He had to be readmitted to the hospital. Cultures from his bronchoscopy remained negative at that point still for AFD, although still a little early. Chest x-ray was unchanged. The CD medications had to be held because liver function tests were significantly more than five times normal. And finally, at this point, toxic serology was obtained, and it was, in fact, positive with an enzyme immunoassay positive confirmed with a fixed titer of 1 to 32. So now that you have positive toxic serology, would you also continue empiric TB treatment? The polls are open. Oops, I have to open the poll. Sorry. Um, let's see, can I? Can I? Open the polls here. I'm having trouble opening the poll here. There it is. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, it's good to see there's no uniformity of opinion because these cases don't produce a uniformity. But uh, it looks like about almost half of you would say yes, and uh, maybe uh, three out, uh, two out of five would say no. I'm going to show you the results. Uh, Okay, so not a consensus. So is TB still possible? Yes. Um, do you need to treat for coxy? Uh, how would you treat a dual infection if you think it's both a TB and a fungus? So, Kevin, I'm going to ask you these questions. What do you think? Well, you, you already pointed out, Gisela, that you, you frequently run into these kind of problems. Uh, you begin empiric therapy while you're waiting for your uh, test to come back. I think, you know, one thing that could have been done better in this case is that the coxyserology should have been drawn up um, up front when the person presented. Uh, and probably at this point you would have an answer on the coxy. Uh, you know, you would have an answer much sooner. Um, you know, I think at this point, I think it's most likely he has coccidioid and mycosis. I'm not sure I'd continue his TB therapy. There are uh, difficulties in treating, uh, you know, for TB and coccy at the same time. There's lots of drug-drug interactions you have to consider, particularly with rifampin and uh, itraconazole and fluconazole. Um, you know, if you were going to go down that road, you, you should probably uh, monitor itraconazole uh, levels as you're treating for both. I think in this guy at this point, I would peel off his TB therapy. I'd certainly follow his cultures out, but I would I would uh, treat him for coxie. Yeah, I think I think probably most of us would feel that way. I think the one uh, stickler in the in the question is, you know, when do you stop that empiric therapy? Do you wait for the cultures to come back negative, um, or if you have another uh, strong diagnostic possibility that you, that you feel is the real cause of his problem, but, you know, to stop it. In his case, because of the uh, fact that he was in a prison setting, I think there were a lot of concerns about the possibility of the PD transmission risk to others. So if we can go on to, let me see if I, oh, good, it's working now. So in this case, itraconazole, 200 milligrams twice daily was begun. The patient continued to be treated for TB, but without rifampin and without INH because of the elevated liver function tests. This is a uh, liver sparing regimen that you see here, but also it gets around some of those drug drug interactions until his BAL culture came back negative at six weeks. And I think that was a conservative approach, um, and perhaps uh, others would have chosen. You know, to just go with the coxie diagnosis. He was treated for six months. He rapidly improved. His final chest X-ray is as follows. Do you want to comment on that, Phil? Yes, yeah, normal. Great. Yeah, it was a good outcome from that point of view. 
So um, although a miliary disseminated picture is not that common in Toxie, it does occur more frequently in certain ethnic groups, notably African American and Filipino, so this patient would fit into that category. You know, so that should be first on, on, on one spot. Um, we often use the term in California, valley fever for coccidioidomycosis, um, but it typically doesn't present with a miliary picture. Um, a classical picture for uh, toxi is, in fact, a thin-walled cavity, which I'm going to point out for you here. Not a very even line. Um, but, uh, again, just because something is a cavity, you know, it really doesn't mean that it's TB. Uh, but, Phil, I don't know if you want to comment on, on your experience with toxic presentation. Well, I, I think I, I actually don't know the proportion of patients who have coxy and then end up with residual uh, thin wall cavity. Uh, however, when you see a thin wall cavity like this in, in our area, particularly why coxy is the classic association that comes to mind. Thanks, Phil. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that well, sometimes these di diseases really can't be diagnosed without a biopsy, and so sometimes we come up then with, you know, caseating, non-caseating granulomas on biopsy, but without a definitive stain. And on your left, you see uh, the you know mycobacteria that can be TB, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and then the fungi that we've already talked about. These are really uh, serologic diagnoses frequently because it is often that we don't see them, um, you know, with, with a biologic specimen. Uh, the parasites there, that's tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, which we also mentioned as part of, uh, of miliary TB findings. And then the non-infectious diseases, and there were some here that we didn't have under miliary. One of them is Wegener's granulomatosis, and I, I, was, I know personally I was burned with one case who had Wegener's that I thought was... TB until it became obvious that it wasn't, um, and then rheumatoid nodules, uh, granulomatosis, in addition, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, these can all produce uh, granulomas, you know, on biopsy findings, and you still need to make that differential between it and TB. So, you know, just to summarize this case, when you find a chest X-ray pattern that's miliary, you know, the infectious and non-infectious differential diagnosis is broad, but you always need to at least consider the diagnosis of TB, as I mentioned. But in many situations, other diagnoses will be more likely, and you really do need to, you know, to look for those um, for definitive uh, diagnoses for these other conditions. Um, the decision about beginning empiric treatment for TB, if initial tests don't tell you what's going on, it really has to be based on risk factors for TB, the local epidemiology of TB, the likelihood of an alternative diagnosis, and the consequences in terms of transmission of TB if it's not treated. And likewise, if TB is not culture confirmed, you still need to make a clinical decision about stopping treatment and by taking all of those factors again into consideration. So I'm going to stop there and turn this over to Phil. Okay, thanks, Gisela. The, the second case is one that's contributed by David Park from uh, the University of Washington and illustrates uh, several important points in the diagnosis uh, management and follow-up of uh, patients uh, with tuberculosis or other diseases that can be confused with tuberculosis. Uh, the patient is a 54-year-old African-American man <clears throat> who presented with a chronic cough, but that was worse for the past three months. Uh, during that time, it was occasionally productive of a blood tin sputum. Hit mild to moderate shortness of breath on exertion, uh, but denied fever. He did uh, indicate that he had had about a 15-pound weight loss. Uh, important in his history is that he's an unemployed construction worker, a recovering alcoholic, and a heavy smoker, 60-pack years. He had no known tuberculosis exposures or uh, tuberculosis risks, although I'll get back to that toward the end of the presentation. And he uh, gave a history of having had a negative HIV test three years prior to uh, his presentation, although this wasn't documented uh, in his medical records. On physical examination, 
the notable findings were that uh, his vital signs were normal. He looked chronically ill and had uh, evidence of weight loss with, with wasting. There was no lymphadenopathy detected. His lungs were clear. The cardiac examination was normal. His abdomen was soft with no organomegaly, masses or fluid. He had no leg edema, but he did have uh, digital clubbing. Uh, the routine laboratory data uh, showed a mild anemia with an hematocrit of 34. His uh, white blood cell count and differential were normal, as were his uh, serum electrolytes and creatinine. Liver functions, likewise, were normal, except uh, for a serum albumin of 3.2. So these findings basically corroborate the uh, differential diagnosis that would be generated uh, over the um, by the history. Um, and he so it didn't really narrow things down uh, to speak of. The next study that was done logically enough was a chest film, which should appear here momentarily. Um, <laughs> that, <What's there? laughs> the circle's in the wrong spot. Somehow the circle moved. Um, what that's intended to be circling is the uh, opacity that you see in the left upper lung field um, that uh, has an ill-defined upper border um, and a suggestion of lucency or cavitation uh, in the middle there. Uh, so I might ask Gisla what she thinks the differential would be at this point and how she would proceed with the, the next phase of diagnostic tests. Well, I would really agree that you know, there is a suggestion of some cavitary uh, changes in that in that lesion, and it is somewhat ill-defined. With that kind of a heavy smoking history, I think you have to think um, about cancer as as, as a very uh, very high on your list of differential diagnoses. But you know, he is also an older person, um, and you know, with alcoholism, we we know the association with TB. So I think that that also would be a consideration in this case. So. You know, sputums for AFB would certainly be appropriate, but a CT scan would be appropriate as well. Okay, so uh, they took your advice and um, obtained a uh, sputum for uh, acid fast organisms. And as you see here on this smear, this the, the uh, or in this slide, the smear turned out to be heavily positive. And this time the circle is in the right spot, and you see it uh, circling uh, actually a, a clump of acid fast organisms uh, as well as a, a couple of individual organisms. So this is a, a heavily positive uh, acid fast smear uh, that does not confirm the diagnosis of tuberculosis, but is strongly suggested in this setting that, in fact, uh, what this patient has is tuberculosis. So... The patient was begun on treatment with a standard four-drug regimen, and the sputum culture uh, confirmed that, in fact, the organism seen was mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, the cough improved with treatment, and by two months, the sputum smear was negative. However, there was a bit of a problem in that he continued to be symptomatic. He continued to lose weight and, in fact, had a new onset of chest pain. So, Kevin, how would you respond to this? Sure. I, I mean, this is. I find this troublesome at this point. Uh, you have someone of a mixed picture. He's he seems to be responding to TB therapy at least microbiologically. His sputum has improved, yet from a symptomatic standpoint, he's worsening. Um, I think you need to take a step back and um, reevaluate the patient as to whether there's something else going on to explain this, or or perhaps in fact his TB um, is worsening, and for some reason we're just not finding it in his sputum. Um, as readily. So, you know, the differential is, uh, has he developed drug resistance? Uh, is he absorbing his medications? Um, and then again, the possibility that uh, something else is going on, something other than TB, either non-infectious or perhaps, uh, you know, an immune reconstitution-like phenomenon uh, related to his TB therapy. Yeah, so I would agree with all, all those. And the, the important point is that things aren't going as you would expect. You'd expect that he would uh, improve symptomatically as well as microbiologically. The two ought to go hand in hand, and that's not uh, actually what is going on. So uh, he had a 
test film uh, that was uh, done at month two. Uh, the, the month two film is shown here uh, beside the baseline film. The red circles this time are in the right location. And, and you can see that he has uh, the, the abnormality in the left upper lung field is essentially unchanged or perhaps even a little worse. It looks to my eye like it might be a little more solid and um, perhaps a bit larger, although I can't really uh, say that uh, with great uh, certainty. And I also think that uh, perhaps there is, um, even on the baseline film, uh, some enlargement of the left hilum, which would be concerning. So um, at this point, there are several questions that need to be addressed. Kevin brought these up. Uh, the first would be, is this TB with organisms that, have, that either were at baseline drug resistant or have become drug resistant? Uh, second would be, is he actually taking his uh, anti-tuberculosis drugs? Third, is he absorbing the drugs? Fourth, as Kevin mentioned, does he have another disease? And if so, what's the differential? And finally, what do we do now? So um, there were some answers at this point. The organisms were shown to be fully susceptible to first-line drugs, and the patient was taking his drugs. He was, on, uh, in fact, on daily DOT. Is he absorbing the drugs? Well, we didn't have specific measurements of serum concentrations, but he said his urine was orange. That suggested, uh, strongly suggests that he's absorbing at least uh, the rifampin. So as best we can tell, uh, the things that would suggest microbiologic failure or failure of uh, the TB therapy uh, are not present. So one has to be thinking of other diseases. And what we would do now was what was done. Uh, they obtained further uh, imaging with a CT scan, and you see one cut here of the CT. We don't have an image from the baseline uh, evaluation to compare, but what you see is this uh, fairly complex uh, cavitary lesion that has some uh, disturbing features. The, the inner cavitary wall is, let's see if I can get the bouncing ball up here. The intracavitary wall is irregular, and particularly there, that could just be debris in the cavity, but nevertheless causes an irregularity. The cavity wall is thick, and then there are these things that the radiologists would call speculations um, that are uh, always concerning for uh, a lesion being uh, malignant. And uh, this is just another cut from the same CT scan showing essentially the same findings again a somewhat thickened, irregular cavitary wall in a lesion that has speculation. So, um, however, at this point, in spite of these findings and the failure to respond appropriately symptomatically, um, the uh, persons taking care of him did not feel anything further needed to be done. Uh, he completed four months of treatment, the initial two months daily and the, sub the subsequent two months uh, with uh, twice weekly directly observed therapy, but then he disappeared and was lost to follow up for uh, about three months. He returned because his symptoms progressed. He had further weight loss and persistent chest pain. The evaluation uh, showed uh, at that time showed again that his sputum uh, was uh, FB negative and a repeat uh, chest film was, was shown. Uh, a repeat CT was obtained and is shown in the next slide. And again, we see this complex, now even more complicated, more complex cavitary lesion, again with irregularity and thickened walls and speculation. Um, and another cut from the same uh, CT, again, showing these the same findings here, the, the thickness of the uh, wall of the cavity is even greater. So, um, Isla, what would, what would you be thinking at this point? 
Well, I would say this doesn't look very good for this patient. Um, this is a very worrisome uh, CT findings. Uh, the lesion is larger. It's. Uh, I would really be very concerned about neoplasm at this point because it's certainly. I suppose it's conceivable that it was because he was off his TB meds, but his smear is now negative. Um, I, I would be very concerned about uh, about another diagnosis. Okay, so the questions that uh, arise at this point are, is it incompletely treated or recurrent tuberculosis? Is drug resistance likely? Should an empiric regimen for MDR-TB be started? And should additional diagnostic tests be performed? And uh, again, I might ask Gisela to uh, how she would uh, address these questions. Well, the patient started out with culture positive tuberculosis, and he's really only completed four months of treatment before he was lost to follow up. It's a fairly long treatment break. I think he he needed additional treatment when he returned to care. Um, I think the question then being whether to restart a new regimen to consider drug resistance um, or just to um, finish up the final two months of treatment or to treat him now uh, with four months as a culture negative case since his repeat specimens on his return to care were negative. Considering that he may be on immunosuppressive cancer treatment in the future looking at this, I would I would favor giving him a total of four months of treatment after this return to care. I mean, in retrospect, there was more irregularity in that inter in the interior of his initial cavity than you usually see with TB. He certainly didn't seem to improve on treatment symptomatically. You know, lung cancer is a common disease and really deserves consideration in this heavy smoker. But in truth, you know, with his positive smear and culture for TB initially, I think most people probably would not have pursued another diagnosis at that point. What do you think, Phil? No, I would, I would agree with that. I would have been satisfied with the, the diagnosis uh, at, uh, at the outset, uh, although I think I, I would like to think that I would have uh, opted to, to uh, evaluate him more completely at the two-month juncture. Uh, just with regard to these questions, it certainly could be incompletely treated tuberculosis, although uh, or recurrent tuberculosis, although we don't have evidence to that point uh, uh, currently. I would think drug resistance is probably unlikely, given that he had initially susceptible organisms uh, and that he was on DOT for the the four months that he took therapy. So he was not taking medications irregularly. And uh, given that reasoning, I, I would not start an empiric regimen for MDR-TB, but certainly would perform additional uh, diagnostic studies to try to determine what, in fact, it is that's, that's going on. So uh, his evaluation at this point, then, in included uh, sputum smears that were uh, smear negative. Uh, he was restarted on uh, uh, four-drug anti-TB therapy. Uh, pending culture and DST results, and I think I, I certainly would agree with Gisela's reasoning uh, in restarting his anti-tuberculosis therapy. He, however, underwent bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage and transbronchial lung biopsy, and both of those uh, were diagnostic of adenocarcinoma. turns out that all cultures from sputum and uh, spontaneous sputum and the bronchoscopic specimens were negative for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this is, this is an unusual case, I have to say. Uh, and concomitant tuberculosis and lung cancer are unusual. Uh, tuberculosis and lung cancer do share risks. Uh, he is a heavy smoker, and there's increasing evidence emerging that tobacco smoking is an important risk factor for tuberculosis. Uh, alcohol may be as well, although that's not as well established as, as tobacco smoking. And we don't really know about his occupational uh, exposures, but uh, potentially he could have been exposed to something that would have... Uh, certainly uh, increased his risk of lung cancer and possibly his risk of tuberculosis. The two diseases have very similar clinical presentations, um, a chronic wasting illness characterized by cough, sometimes with chest pain, uh, 
shortness of breath, hemoptysis, uh, and extrapulmonary findings. And as you'll recall, he had digital pubbing uh, that can occur with both tuberculosis and lung cancer. And then there are shared radiographic features that can cause diagnostic confusion. Nodule uh, infiltrates, masses, cavitation, although unusual in lung cancer, certainly occurs. Uh, intrathoracic adenopathy and pleural effusions all may occur with uh, both uh, tuberculosis and lung cancer, although uh, intrathoracic adenopathy is unusual in adults with, with tuberculosis. There are data uh, pretty well established, uh, pretty well done reviews that uh, indicate that uh, tuberculosis does increase the risk of cancer, although uh, these studies basically look at prior tuberculosis as a risk for subsequent development of lung cancer. And in most of these reviews, it ends up being uh, a relative risk of about two, close to two, for persons who have had TB, uh, uh, the risk uh, for developing lung cancer. But again, having the two uh, together uh, concomitantly is uh, uh, quite unusual. And as I said, I would have uh, been content with the tuberculosis diagnosis initially, but uh, would have uh, followed him up uh, more carefully when he didn't respond to treatment at the outset, or at the two-month juncture anyway. There are some radiographic features that would lead one to suspect cancer. Uh, during the initial evaluation, uh, one would uh, always need to uh, ask for risks uh, that uh, could increase the likelihood of lung cancer being present. And on chest radiograph, mass lesions would uh, should be evaluated with uh, at least a consideration of CT scanning early on, or uh, close uh, follow-up with uh, with chest radiographs at uh, one to two months after initiation of therapy uh, to verify that the abnormalities are not progressing and hopefully are responding to TB treatment. And finally, during TB treatment, it's uh, very important to monitor the response, both in terms of the microbiologic response as well as the symptomatic and radiographic response. And uh, I think that's the major problem that uh, occurred in, in this patient. Uh, there wasn't, uh, at least there, although there was follow-up, there was not response to the findings in the follow-up. Uh, Kevin, any, any comments at this point? Yeah, I think you hit the major points, Phil. I mean, we certainly see this in the context of uh, TB control, particularly in areas that are rural or in areas where uh, patients are being handled by, um, uh, you know, physicians without uh, specialist experience or without TB experience or mid-level providers, for example. Um, you know, it's often difficult to get patients into a specialist or to even get a CT scan done, and that's usually an access to care issue. Uh, the patients don't have insurance, et cetera. And I know we struggle with that in the state of Oregon, particularly in some of our rural regions, uh, but even in urban regions, it's often hard to find um, someone uh, to actually see a patient for free or to, to agree to do a CT scan for free, um, it, or at least can take several weeks to work out. I mean, in this patient, certainly, you know, at the two-month period, I think a, a CT scan was the right thing to do, and referring them to a specialist to interpret that CT scan and, and um, you know, that, that was what needed to happen. And I, and I recognize the challenges of doing that sometimes um, in, in the TB control setting. Okay, thanks. Um, there are some um, helpful radiographic features that can suggest whether a, a given cavitary lesion is benign or malignant. Uh, here you see a couple of examples, a very thin wall cavity, uh, with a uniform wall thickness, uh, very much like the cavity that was seen in Giesler's case or that Giesler showed in association with her case uh, as being a residual of uh, coccidial mycosis. Uh, those are almost always benign. Um, the general rule is that the maximum uh, wall thickness for a tuberculous cavity is uh, 
uh, less than four uh, millimeters, uh, and it should be more regular as seen in this uh, chest radiograph uh, where the, there's a lot of surrounding infiltration that makes the thickness of the wall difficult to ascertain, but you can clearly see that the uh, inner aspect of the cavity is regular. And then here you see a much more uh, ugly looking cavitary lesion with a, a very thick wall and uh, an irregular uh, inner lining of the wall consistent with a malignant cavity. And also an unusual feature, uh, or what would be an unusual feature for a tuberculous cavity, an air fluid level here uh, at the bottom of the, of the cavity. Bill, can I jump in real quick? That air fluid level is very interesting because um, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is lung abscess, which can also masquerade, you know, it's a, you know, a cavity, it really can look like TB, but a clue can be the presence of an air fluid level, which is very unusual for tuberculosis. Yeah, very good point. And you could have a cavity that looked like this with a necrotic uh, uh, anaerobic pneumonia and lung abscess formation. Okay, so um, there are other findings that may suggest malignancy. As with the lesion in the patient just presented, the spiculated contours, you see these little things that sort of stick out into the lung parenchyma surrounding the lesion. Um, not shown here, uh, eccentric calcification in a lesion. Calcification is associated with a benign process but uh, that needs to be in a certain pattern for more concentric calcification. Eccentric calcification uh, is more associated with malignancy. And then uh, a, a test that we commonly use in working up patients who have lung masses to determine if it is malignant or benign is a uh, PET uh, CT scan. And here you see in this panel a very hot lesion corresponding to this lesion on the CT scan. Uh, that suggests that this is a lung malignancy. But just to point out that things can not always be as they seem, a biopsy of this lesion was done, and it turned out to be TB. And this was a uh, follow-up uh, after treatment for tuberculosis, showing resolution, largely resolution, of this abnormality. So it can go either way. Um, So there are other possibilities uh, if the clinical and radiographic uh, picture is not improving on treatment. Um, and basically we've already mentioned these, that they're non-infectious or non-malignant uh, causes uh, of TB-like abnormalities. And as Kevin mentioned, commonly this needs to be referred for uh, specialist evaluation. And Gisela, I think, already went through the differential diagnosis of granulomatous disease, which is, although we very commonly think of it as being characteristic of tuberculosis, and it is, it is certainly not limited to tuberculosis. And so if, a, if you have a biopsy that shows granulomas, uh, one needs to think what, what differential that entails. And I think I'll skip this one and go on to the take-home points relative to this case. Uh, first of all, monitoring the response to treatment is nearly as important as making the proper diagnosis and initiating treatment. If the response, either clinical or radiographic, is not as expected, uh, especially if it's slow or incomplete, then you need to stop, reconsider the deferential, and undertake uh, a reevaluation of the patient. TB and lung cancer share a number of features, and they can certainly mimic one another and therefore uh, be confused for one another, and as this case illustrates, can occasionally occur together. And finally, although radiographic findings can suggest malignancy, these findings are nonspecific uh, and uh, need to be followed up with appropriate uh, uh, diagnostic tests, uh, often including uh, uh, tissue sampling in order to make a definitive diagnosis. So I'll stop with that and turn over to Kevin for case number three. You bet. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Lisa. Um, 
my case is entitled TB or, or maybe not, which is uh, actually the theme of this uh, entire webinar. Um, so with that, we'll start. Uh, thanks for having me on board for this. So this is uh, a patient I saw not too uh, uh, long ago, actually. It was a 56-year-old uh, female who was white. She was U.S. born. And she was referred uh, because she'd had a 14-week history of a productive cough that hadn't responded to a couple rounds of antibiotics. And then really more recently, uh, the onset of fever, malaise, and night sweats really in the last three or four weeks. And when queried, she, she admitted to, to losing some weight, in fact, about 10 pounds in the last four or five weeks. Her medical history is uh, important, and she does have uh, rheumatoid factor positive or seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. She had had this long standing for uh, 10 or 12 years, and it had worsened um, to the point where she'd been on chronic prednisone, in fact, the last uh, one to two years, um, and currently she'd been on a 5 milligram dose at least in the last few weeks before seeing me. Uh, also to note, she had started infliximab, an anti-TNF drug, which we all know on the phone is a risk factor for TB and other granulomatous diseases. Um, she had started this approximately one year ago. Uh, in terms of medical comorbidities, she was a smoker. She had COPD, like the, the last patient. She had a pretty heavy smoking uh, history, uh, but no diabetes or other um, medical conditions. On physical exam, um, I don't have a picture of her, but you can picture a very small, thin, and cachectic appearing woman uh, around five feet, maybe 105 pounds or 100 pounds. Uh, her vital signs were normal, although she had a slight tachycardia with a heart rate of 105. Uh, she had no lymph lymphadenopathy. Uh, her lung exam was notable for diminished breath sounds in the right upper lung field, but otherwise normal, uh, with the exception of a few rowels in the mid-lung fields bilaterally, but no wheezing uh, and no evidence of consolidation. Her cardiac exam was normal uh, with regards to a, a lack of murmur and no rubs or gallops. So I have her, her chest x-ray here, which... Uh, it's fairly uh, unremarkable other than the fact that she has some areas uh, that, that would be suggestive of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, and then let me get my little highlighter pointer here. that You can appreciate, I think, there is some uh, increased density in the right upper lobe here as compared to the left. Uh, and this was suspicious uh, for some sort of infiltrate uh, and it triggered our um, further evaluation with a um, CT scan, which I'll get to in, in just a moment. In terms of other diagnostic studies at this point, uh, her CBC showed uh, an anemia with a hemoglobin of 10. Her white blood cell count was uh, borderline elevated. She did have an increased uh, monocytosis in her, uh, within her CBC differential. Her renal and liver function panels were normal. Uh, because of the right upper lobe uh, density and because of her history of chronic respiratory decline, we did obtain sputum uh, that day in the clinic. And we sent the sputum for routine culture, AFB culture, and fungal culture. And, um, and of course, what always happens when I do that on Friday, my clinic's on Friday, I was called that night about midnight by the lab tech with an emergency saying she had a four AFB smear positive specimen, and what did I want to do about it? <laughs> so at midnight, I told her I was going to do nothing and I was going to go to sleep, but I did think about it the next day when I woke up. Um, Giza, what, what would you be thinking about it at this point in terms of differential and management? Well, um, you have a question on your slide, could this patient have TB, and I think the answer to that is yes. But um, the differential diagnosis with this presentation, I mean, she's a thin, middle-aged woman who's a smoker. Um, there, are, uh, there are other possibilities, you know, cancer, as we've already heard about, but more uh, importantly, um, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. I think at this point I'd want to look to see whether she had any risk factors for TB at all. That's good. Phil, your thoughts? Well, uh, I, I agree with Gisela. Um, I certainly would. My, my, my first bet would be that she has TB, uh, and, um, but wouldn't forget that there are other things that can be AFB, that can be uh, uh, smear positive, and that's positive. Uh, no cardio would be one of the things that you'd be thinking about in a woman who's uh, on immunosuppressive therapy. 
and uh, pregnancy with uh, this kind of abnormality on, on chest radiogram. And that really brings up the point that um, nucleic acid amplification testing, or NAT, can be very, very helpful in this situation. Um, if your results are positive for the MTB complex, you know, that's very strong evidence that you're dealing with tuberculosis. Of course, if it's negative, you also have to remember to check for inhibitors that are sometimes present in the sputum that can cause falsely negative results, even if it is TB on a positive smear. I think the NAT test, unfortunately, is underutilized. Um, one reason for that might be that there's a lack of easy access to the test in many settings. And so the delay in getting a NAT test done um, is almost as long as the delay in getting a positive culture. Absolutely. I agree with both uh, of your input. Thank you. And certainly uh, a NAT could be very useful here. Um, in the state of Oregon, we, we do try to do a NAT at least on one of the first three sputums of each suspect. Um, and, you know, this is what we tried to do with this patient. Of course, this particular specimen, it was midnight on Friday night, and they had already processed it, so we could not nap the specimen. We had to get another specimen the next day. But, of course, it could be very useful in making um, uh, decisions early on with regards to isolation and, and uh, treatment. Um, let's go to her risk factors, Gisela. You mentioned, and, of course, this is where we all should start. You know, history is, is of primary importance. And what are her t TB risk factors? And we know she has AFB-positive bacilli uh, or AFB-positive um, organisms in her smear, uh, and I think the differential is pretty small. It's some sort of mycobacterium or nocardia, like Phil mentioned. And um, there's a few other possibilities that can be weakly acid fast, but really would be unlikely and, and probably aren't worth talking about. Um, you know, in terms of her TB risk factors, um, she did, in fact, have some risk factors. They're not on the slide, but I'll tell them to you. Uh, she, well, although she was U.S. born, it turns out she'd, she'd been in Southeast Asia for one or two years as a Peace Corps volunteer uh, 20 or 30 years ago. She said that she'd been uh, screened negative with a, a skin test long ago, but then hadn't been screened again until about a year ago before starting her infliximab. That is the recommendation. Anyone starting TNF-alpha inhibitor therapy should be screened for TB prior to initiation, and she was, in fact, done so correctly by her rheumatologist. Um, a, a skin test was used, and it was negative. Now, I didn't have record of that, but she gave me a good history. Uh, but, you know, I asked, and, and it turned out she was on 15 or 20 milligrams of prednisone a day during that time, too. So the possibility of a false negative uh, skin test, I think, needed to be um, considered or at least kept in the back of, of your mind. Um, Diesel, what, what are your thoughts at this point? Well, I think you've just raised an important point is, was that truly a negative skin test a year ago? Um, you know, this could have been false negative because of the prednisone. Um, 30 years ago uh, is a long time ago, so I, I, it's certainly not a potential recent exposure to TB. But, of course, she's now has that added risk factor of TNF-alpha use, so there is that possibility of, of uh, recrudescence of a, of a long latent infection. Yeah, good. Thanks. So um, this was on the weekend. We, we called her Monday morning, had her come back Monday for a CT scan. So we were able to, you know, again, we had access to resources, access to, uh, you know, specialist care, and we were able to do this pretty quickly, uh, which was lucky. And here's her CT scan I just put up, and clearly there's a, a very thick-walled, uh, fairly small but thick-walled cavity in the right upper lobe here. The rest of her lung fields uh, look just fine, actually. She had no lymphadenopathy. And um, with this, we also collected uh, further specimens that day in clinic. Kevin, I might interject here that that seat, the lesion uh, on CT shows a lot of the features that I pointed out as being consistent with malignancy. Uh, Absolutely, yeah, and this thick wall here was, was a bit troublesome to me, and the question whether there was something in the wall of that cavity was raised by the, the radiologist. She does have a smoking history, I and mean, this is something we were thinking about. Um, and in fact, when we collected her sputum, we did send it for cytology. I, I don't know if you have a comment on the, the sensitivity of cytology and sputum for, for detecting cancer. Well, I think it depends a lot on the... Uh, the, the institution and the laboratory, and uh, uh, but it's uh, a fairly high yield. I, I can't give you a percentage. Again, it will vary with the institution. But again, you can see a very thick wall cavity and some 
gesticulation here. So this would be consistent with or concerning for malignancy. Yeah, it's so worth doing. And the cytology, in fact, ended up negative. So we 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 did think about it, and it's it was still in the back of our mind despite the negative cytology. But we did go forward with um, with therapy, and I can tell you about that therapy in a in a minute here. Um, I'll just jump in quick, though, too. You know, it, it, again, on that test at this point, which has been very, very useful with that positive smear, um, if, if it were to be positive, but I think, um, you know, not having that available or thinking about other things, you know, that given her history, TB may not be the most likely diagnosis, but again, uh, she probably should be advised to begin home isolation pending any further information. And if she were very ill or, you know, uh, acutely, more acutely ill, and not just walking into your office. Um, I think it does bring up the issue of whether to, in, to start empiric treatment for TB while you're sorting it out. Sure. Uh, thoughts on treatment, Phil? Would you start? Would you wait? No, I'd start. I mean, in most of the world, uh, you've already got more uh, evidence in favor of a diagnosis of tuberculosis than you would ever have. Uh, given that you've got the, the radiograph, the CT scan, and a positive smear. And I would uh, just presume she has TB and start her own treatment. Yeah, I agree. I think that's very reasonable. Um, you know, we had a discussion with her about that, and she was someone who is home uh, alone. She wasn't around other people. She was really resistant to starting TB therapy, although she was feeling pretty poorly. Uh, we were able to get another sputum on that uh, that Monday and send it off for, for Nat. So we had an answer pretty quickly, or at least a, a good hint, and then that ended up being negative. That second sputum was, again, 4-plus smear positive, and we had a negative Nat. So uh, we we did not start TB therapy, although I completely agree with uh, what you and, and Gisela have, have said there in terms of um, thinking about offering empiric therapy. You know, the other decision we had to make pretty quickly was, you know, what to do about our immunosuppressive uh, medication. And the, the polls are open there and people are starting to vote. Uh, you know, this question comes up frequently for uh, clinicians and, off, you know, TB uh, controllers who are uh, forced to um, think about or make a recommendation back to the rheumatologist, you know, what do I do while I start treating this person for TB or and working them up. So what would you guys do, everyone on the call, with regards to infliximab and prednisone? Would you continue? Would you stop them? Uh, stop them both? So you can go ahead and vote there, and I'll close the polls here in a second. The votes are just rolling in. <laughs> You know, it's interesting that there seems to be, just like in my polling questions, a, a lot of uh, diversity of opinion. Yeah, so I'll, I'll show the results. So we're pretty evenly split here. Some said they continue, about 40% said they continue, and uh, fairly evenly split between stopping the infliximab and stopping um, infliximab and, and prednisone. So you can you can stop uh, stop voting, and I'll, I'll ask for some comments on the on the votes. Uh, Phil, do you, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I would vote for C. <laughs> uh, even if she is fairly profoundly immunosuppressed, as we see in patients with uh, advanced HIV disease, I'd expect her to res if she has TB. I would expect her to respond uh, uh, appropriately to treatment. So. I wouldn't be too concerned about continuing her immunosuppressive medications. <clears throat> Again, presuming she has TB and presuming it's drug susceptible. Sure. And, you know, for, from a clinical standpoint, the, the question of whether to stop infliximab or not is somewhat of a moot point. This is a drug dosed usually every eight weeks, sometimes every four weeks. So probably this woman is not due for a, another infusion for many weeks anyway. You can kind of defer that question uh, for a few more weeks until you've figured out what she has and whether she's responding to therapy, et cetera. And, you know, the prednisone, I, I agree, I wouldn't stop it. I mean, she's been on a low-dose prednisone for a long time. Uh, stopping it may, in fact, do a disservice to her. She may be somewhat dependent on it at this point. So, And it's not going to to kill your, your therapy against TB, uh, that's for sure. So I would probably... Uh, keep her on the friend zone without doubt and then and then make those decisions while you're you're you know defer the infliximab decision just because you can uh, until you have a better sense of what's going on. <laughs>
I'll jump in real quickly. Um, I think, you know, again, as, as Phil has said, you know, really uh, for drug-susceptible TB, uh, even with profound immunosuppression, you know, the drugs are generally good enough um, to overcome that and, and for cure. But, for example, with drug-resistant tuberculosis, particularly MDR-TB, um, or with non-tuberculous mycobacteria or other infections, sometimes, again, you know, the drugs are not that good. And, uh, and discontinuing agents that are immunosuppressant may really be more important. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, certainly with infections like NTM and even COXI, I mean, these are much more difficult infections to cure. And I have strong reservations about using antitinotherapy even while you're treating those type of infections. I think, like Phil said, with TB, you can, you can do it. Um, although, again, I, I think in most recommendations out there would say that you should at least temporarily stop the, the infliximab until you've got the patients on their TB medications and you've verified that they're improving. Um, I think that would be very reasonable, and that, that would be in line with most recommendations. But I think, again, to make the point that you usually have some time to sort this out because this is dosed so infrequently. So they're going to be, even after one dose of infliximab with their half-life, they're going to be exposed to infliximab uh, that's just in their body circulating for about 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, so um, that's just something to keep in mind. Well, what is the probability this person has TB? Well, in the absence of a NAD, you can actually look at uh, some predictive values based on their clinical and epidemiologic um, characteristics. And this is a study that we did in um, Oregon um, last year, and we took uh, everyone with AFB in their respiratory isolate for a two-year time period. It's 2005, 2006. And um, this was instructive, and we, we do use this, I think, around the state somewhat to to at least up front make some decisions about whether the person might have TB or not. And to take you through this, there was, there was 207 people with AFB and respiratory uh, samples during that, two time, time, uh, during that time period during those two years. And the first thing we thought of is splitting them uh, by age. And if you look at people who are uh, under 50 versus people over 50, you can see if you're under 50, you know, 70 percent of people or the positive predictive value was 0.7, or 70 percent of these people had TB, whereas if you look at the older uh, people over age 50, you know, only 23 percent of them had TB, meaning the rest of them had non-TB microbacterium. The next characteristic to, to look at uh, really uh, then has to do with where they're from. And we all know that being foreign born is, is a very important risk factor for TB in our country. And if you look at people under age 50, if they're not born in the U.S., almost all these people have TB. 0.98, 98% of them have TB. Uh, if they're U.S. born, that percentage is much smaller. Next, if you, uh, here is the U.S. born. And if you look in the older people who are U.S. born, again, the percentage of these with TB is much smaller, 0.16 or 16%. So, um, and then lastly, looking at the presence of chronic underlying lung disease, if you look in older patients, U.S. born, who have COPD, you know, very few of these people have TB, only 8% of these people. And this, in fact, would, our patient would fit into this. Uh, category. Now, uh, this is data from a low incidence TB state. I, I'm not sure how well it generalizes to other uh, areas in the country, uh, but I, I do think it probably generalizes to other low incidence situations. Gisela, do you have a sense from a state of California perspective? Geez, I think this is a very useful slide and very useful information. I think in California there probably is a higher likelihood for TB because we're not a low incidence state. So one would have to take local TB incidents into account um, and maybe use our own numbers. Um, however, you know, following this thought process, it really is going to be helpful when you're considering things like empiric treatment and isolation issues. Uh, for someone who's over 50 U.S. born and has COPD, particularly if they're female, um, we would also recognize in California that the likelihood of TB is quite low. And the fact this patient did have mycobacterium avium uh, complex, and the NAT was negative, we then had to, of course, grow out the cultures, but we had an answer uh, in, in a couple weeks, and uh, she had mycobacterium avium. This is data from a large population study of pulmonary NTM disease, uh, again, generated in Oregon. Uh, we, we lack uh, mycobacterium candaceae, which is an important NTM in the southern states in the U.S., 
but by and large, you know, about 90% of our disease in Oregon and pretty much elsewhere in the country of pulmonary NTM is due to mycobacterium avium, and this is, in fact, what our, our patient had. Um, from this study, too, we documented some very important differences between um, males and females with this disease. There tends to be uh, kind of two forms of disease, and actually this woman had more of the male form of disease, which tends to be more uh, commonly associated with COPD. You can see about 37% of uh, men who have pulmonary NTM have COPD versus 22% of women. The bronchiectatic form uh, is a bit more common in women, which about 20% of females with pulmonary NTM have bronchiectasis versus only 11% of men. And important to point out on this slide, too, is age. You know, median age is in the 60s of these patients. About 25% overall of these patients will have a cavity. Um, and then, again, the, the immunosuppressive therapy seems to be somewhat common. I was surprised by this, but about a quarter of the patients overall have uh, some sort of immunosuppressive uh, therapy ongoing, as usually with prednisone in this um, study. In terms of the risk of NTM uh, in the face of anti-TNF therapies like infliximab or etanercept or adalimumab and others, um, it certainly is elevated. We know that anti-TNF therapy elevates TB risk. We've now documented that it elevates NTM risk. This is data from uh, Gisela from your, your area there, from the Kaiser Permanente Northern California um, region, which is about 3.1 million people living in largely the Bay Area and the, the, the outer um, confines of the Bay Area. And we found in looking at this population, a general population NTM incidence of 4.1 per 100,000 years, slightly higher than uh, the TB incidence of 2.8 per 100,000 years. And I should note that this is this was just culture positive TB. I think probably this rate is actually closer to four once you uh, consider all forms of TB. Um, but you can see the influence of age when you start looking at patients over 50 years old. Again, the, the rate of NTM jumps up quite a bit, and it uh, starts getting much higher than what you see for TB. When you look at rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, in the absence of TNF therapy, you see these rates even go higher. Um, reflecting probably increased risk due to prednisone and increased risk due to RA itself. Um, and when you look at NITNF use, this, this rate goes up substantially in the RA populations with 112 per 100,000, whereas the TB risk also jumps up with TNF use, but it's about half that uh, than the NTM uh, incidence. And this is probably, uh, you know, this is what I would expect elsewhere in the country, although even the differences between NTM and TB even incidence might be more magnified in other areas that are lower, lower incidence in, in TB. Uh, Gisela, do, do you have thoughts from a TB control standpoint? Well, you know, our incidence of, of TB is gradually falling uh, in California, as it is all over the country. So I think, as you just said, we are going to be seeing more and more um, of our positive smears turning out to be NTMs. But we really do have to keep our eye on the ball in terms of TB as well because, um, again, many uh, uh, members of the Kaiser Permanente system, which is what this is taken from, but also in California in general, are foreign-born from high TB incident countries. And there are other risk groups, not just anti-TNF alpha or rheumatoid arthritis patients, where we see uh, a significantly elevated risk of TB. And another example would be dialysis patients, which we've looked at uh, in the Kaiser system, um, uh, in which we also see a fairly high rate of, of TB uh, among those patients. Absolutely. Certainly when there's TB risk factors present, um, the, the possibility of TB is, is much higher than when they're not, although it's always there. TB is always on the differential, <laughs> it seems. So uh, next slide here. Uh, Phil, I'll ask you to comment. This is probably a more common uh, chest X-ray presentation of a female with pulmonary NTM, and uh, I'll ask you to comment on the film as a pulmonologist. So the predominant abnormalities are seen in the uh, right lower lung zone. You can see... Um, increased opacity, uh, maybe a suggestion of a cavity, and then, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, what would 
look like on a plain film, uh, what looks like uh, probably bronchiectasis with irregular airways and uh, uh, probably peribronchial thickening uh, in probably the middle lobe. Uh, it could be lower lobe uh, and middle lobe, but probably this is the least we'll have competing bouncing balls here. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> but that's it. And so, in fact, those. Your reading was uh, corroborated. We, we spent a lot of money getting a CT. We should have just called you. You could have told us the same thing. Uh, but here's your CT scan, which, which in fact shows the, the exact uh, abnormality you just um, discussed, some right uh, middle lobe predominant bronchiectasis. Um, and you can see that cavity that was mentioned also on the right side. She had a little bit of bronchiectasis along the uh, fissure on the left side. Uh, and this, in fact, would be a more common form of uh, pulmonary NTM, at least in uh, the, the middle to older aged uh, females, and, you know, commonly called, quote, unquote, Lady Windermere disease. Um, and this, in fact, was a woman in her 60s, and this, she had mycobacterium abscessus, which is probably the, the third most common uh, cause of pulmonary NTM disease behind avium and candasii in the, the U.S. Just some further background about NTM. Some of you on the call might know these organisms as MOT organisms. Uh, this was the original name of mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. That name was then uh, changed to non-tuberculous mycobacterium or NTM. There are some people that are trying to change it now to EM or environmental mycobacterium. Um, the reason being these are environmental organisms. They're commonly found in soil, lakes, and rivers. They're uh, at your tap water. Uh, they're usually in your tap water at home. If you rain your bath water long enough and collected enough of it, you would generally find it. Um, these guys like to live where there's biofilm, and, and biofilm is, of course, a collection of really organic debris and along your pipes and uh, other places where water flows. These guys live symbiotically with amoeba and legionella and other organisms and really complex um, ecosystems. In terms of uh, the case diagnosis for pulmonary NTM, this is important to emphasize. Because these organisms are ubiquitous in the environment, we can, of course, find them uh, in random sputum samples. You could drink some tap water today and spit it out in a sputum sample, and we might actually culture mycobacterium avium, for example. It doesn't mean you have disease. Um, and because of the ubiquity of these bugs, we, we did come up with a quite a rigid case definition several years ago in order to facilitate the diagnosis and consideration of therapy of these type of patients. And the 2007 ATS IDSA diagnostic criteria uh, are as follows. The patient must have some radiographic evidence of disease and pulmonary symptoms. That seems pretty straightforward, but they should have the characteristic findings on the radiograph and it should be symptomatic. And then from a microbiologic standpoint, they either need to have at least one bronchoscopy specimen that grows uh, mycobacterium, or at least two sputum cultures positive, not just one, but at least two. And, um, and then, of course, evidence of tissue invasion uh, with granuloma cystopathology or a positive culture from a biopsy, that would be uh, good enough to qualify uh, someone for disease. You know, in the uh, past, Kevin, weren't positive smears needed as part of an NPM diagnosis? That's a good question, Giza. I'm glad you brought that up. I, they were, and in fact, the old criteria in 1997 uh, asked for quantitative cultures and also quantitative smears. And you know, when we met in 2007, we we decided to get rid of the quantitative criteria for a couple reasons. Number one, a lot of labs don't do quantitative cultures, so that was very difficult to obtain. And in terms of the quantitative smear requirement, we you know we felt that this case definition was. Uh, sensitive and specific enough that, you know, anyone who walks in who's the right age, has the right radiograph, right symptoms, it, you know, if you're finding the NTM in their sputum, um, regardless of the smear status, probably they have some level of disease. And, you know, in fact, we did a study recently, we published it in the uh, American Journal of Respiratory Medicine and Critical Care of Medicine, the Blue Journal, and we, we did verify that this case definition has a specificity of about 86%. So I think it's fairly specific. If people meet these criteria, they probably do, in fact, truly have disease. Uh, lastly, this, this is a question posed to me uh, by a controller in Oregon recently, and it was a good question. And we were finding many of our TB patients isolated NTM at the time of their TB diagnosis. These are pulmonary TB patients. And someone asked me, geez, is that common? What, what percent of the time does this happen? So 
So we took the opportunity, again, to look at our statewide uh, microbacterial cohort of TB and NTM patients. And we found right there in red, you can see it, 14% of these patients, 14% um, of pulmonary TB patients in Oregon also isolate NTM initially on their, uh, in one of their first three sputums or at least uh, early on in their TB course. Um, so this is pretty common. And I think, um, what about you, Gisela? Do you guys see this in California frequently as well? Yeah, absolutely, um, and I think this is a reasonable uh, estimate of how frequently it happens on the initial isolate. Um, it's certainly not so, uh, unusual to have it, but I think it sometimes really complicates uh, the determination of drug susceptibility testing, and what we also sometimes find is that um, mixed infections that will get a, a, un, a very surprising result of drug resistance in a patient where we didn't suspect it, and when we then go back and look, it turns out that it, it's a dual, you know, uh, dual isolate that there is also NTM present that's, that's giving the, the drug resistant results. So I think that's actually a very important um, point that one has to remember. Um, sometimes, too, you know, we often follow patients, particularly with drug resistance, with multiple cultures during therapy, and it's not at all unusual to get a positive smear or a positive culture during treatment for documented TB that's positive, and it can lead to some issues around isolation and what to do until it's sorted out that it really was an NTM. Sure. You know, my sense clinically is that usually, though, the NTM aren't of, of clinical significance in, in these types of patients. Phil, do you have a, a thought on that? No, I, I agree that it's fairly common that you get uh, saprophytic organisms uh, that appear maybe because of uh, structural damage that the, uh, the, 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 the mycobacterium tuberculosis has caused. But if there's concern that, um, that both infections are significant, particularly if, uh, if you're thinking mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium avium, it's easy enough to construct a regimen that uh, treats both just by adding a macrolide, uh, clarithromycin, particularly to uh, the, the four-drug initial uh, regimen for treating tuberculosis. Easy for me sure, to say yeah. because, uh, but, I mean, it does make people sick, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the regimen is fairly uh, straightforward. Sure, I agree. And in fact, sometimes we do that. Um, I will point out it's probably more of an issue. Pulmonary TB certainly is a risk factor for uh, acquiring NTM later in life. As you pointed out, Phil, the, the architectural destruction, the parenchymal destruction that TB or other infections can cause in the lung can then set someone up to acquire NTM or other environmental organisms later in life and, and, and become infected that way. So uh, I would say it's not infrequent, uh, probably 5 to 10 percent of our NTM patients uh, pulmonary NTM patients have had a history of pulmonary tuberculosis in the distant past. So it's something to keep in mind uh, for the future. Um, well, with that, I'll finish, and I'll, I'll thank everyone for joining us, and I'll hand it back to Lisa, and uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Phil and Gila, for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Great. Well, we're going to move on now to uh, a, a period for you folks out there to be able to ask questions. Um, yeah, as long as you've all, we've all recovered from our flashing screens. I'm sitting here next to Phil, and I think he was having a flashback to his old disco years. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, Where's the ball? But, <laughs> yeah. So, so um, for those of you who would like to, you can certainly submit a text question, um, type it in, and click on the Ask um, buttons on your on your uh, screen. Um, I do want to note that we often get more questions than we can answer in a time period, although we added extra question and answer time to this webinar. If we do run out of time, we will try to take some of the text questions that we haven't gotten to, and we'll put together an FAQ uh, site on our uh, Curry website to try to get to all of your answers. Um, some folks can call in as well if that's what you choose to do to ask the question live. Um, and we'll probably take those calls first. And I'm going to turn things over for a minute to the operator so they can uh, tell you the instructions for calling in questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register for a question, you may press 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. 
You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. Your line will then be accessed from the conference to obtain your information. If at any time you'd like to withdraw your question, you may press 1 followed by the 3. First, we will be taking questions from the phone lines, and if we address all phone questions, we will move to the text questions. We require that you only ask questions related to the seminar con content at this time. All other logistical questions should be emailed to Bob Siedelkon after the seminar. Great. Well, uh, until we find out that we have any questions, I think people will give you a minute to call in or text in the questions. I, I just want to thank the three speakers, um, Isla, Phil, and Kevin, because those are really great cases. I think, you know, the differential diagnosis really is wide, um, and you can't spend two hours and talk about every possibility, nor would I want to see all those lists just flashing on the screen in front of me. But I think what these three cases really illustrated are the common dilemmas that we always run into um, as we see cases for TB. You know, we're always pushing that we have to suspect TB, think TB, but these cases really pointed out when do we have to stop and think about other problems. You know, clearly when the clinical or radiographic presentation includes other things in the differential, we really need to pause as TB clinicians um, and not just do the knee-jerk thing and treat for TB and not see them for a while, and Phil's case really pointed out, even when we were sure we have TB, you have to watch what's happening as you're on TB treatment, because if they're not responding, we've got to stop and rethink the situation, and I think, in fact, Dave Park told me the reason why the two-month um, evaluation for that case um, showed problems, but, um, but, but, but people weren't responding, is it was a classic example of you know, handing off with a lot of different providers in the mix. And I think that just got lost in the message. And we need to be watching for that. We need to be watching for that. And finally, of course, Kevin's case gave us the real uh, classic dilemma that we, you know, found, find all the time is, is the um, NTM as a confounder, and, and particularly in our immunosuppressed population. So uh, those are great cases to go through. And um, I think we have two phone calls, um, so maybe I'll have the operator plug in the first person. And our first question comes from the line of Judy Riddle with Anthem Blue Cross. Please go ahead with your question. Is there any correlation between TB and mesothelioma? Good question. When, how about, when, the, uh, when there's an occupational history? Yeah, but still, you want to make any comments between TB and mesothelioma? So mesothelioma is uh, a consequence of exposure to asbestos in the, generally in the relatively remote past, 20 to 30 years previous. Um, I actually don't know of any correlation between TB and asbestos exposure, or more specifically, TB and mesothelioma. The classic uh, occupational lung disease that increases risk of TB is uh, silicosis or occasionally co-workers pneumoconiosis, which uh, sort of uh, is uh, uh, probably a milder form of, of silicosis. And I don't know of any correlation with asbestos exposure uh, or with uh, mesothelioma. H having said that, I might um, back up and say if the mesothelioma is causing significant uh, systemic problems, uh, particularly wasting general malnutrition, uh, that in itself might increase the risk, but the uh, mesothelioma in itself, uh, so far as I'm aware, doesn't. Yes, yeah, so Kevin, I, I'd agree. I mean, I think if, if it's producing any sort of systemic or localized immunosuppression, then uh, it certainly could be um, something that could promote TB uh, progression, but otherwise, I don't know the association. Thank you. Great. Uh, can we have our ne next question? Uh, our next line? question comes from the line of Jacqueline Duget with Frederick County Health Department. Please go ahead with your question. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. My question has to do with whether or not you, when you have a diff when you have someone that may have um, 
this long differential. Do you ever presumptively ask for a for the rapid test, even though maybe the smears may not may not be may not be positive if you smear testing? Uh, easily, you 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 yeah. uh, want to take that? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, if if you have a, a suspicion, uh, at least a moderate suspicion for TB, and your smears on specimens are negative, we recommend three specimens. Um, there, there's a current recommendation from CDC that at least one of those specimens should have a NAT test done. Um, the data would suggest that with the GenProbe MTD test, that is approved for use on both smear positive and smear negative specimens. And for a culture that is subsequently grows tuberculosis complex, it has about a 70% sensitivity in a smear negative situation. So it's much more sensitive than the smear. So I think definitely it would be worthwhile to uh, to do a nucleic acid amplification test such as the gen probe um, in that situation because it may give you the answer quicker than waiting for the culture. Bill, anything else to add? What do you think about folks in, in, who may have access to gene experts? Well, gene expert is not yet approved for use in the U.S., uh, but is recommended by WHO, or at least is approved by for use by WHO uh, in, in the rest of the world, basically. Uh, and it, uh, the advantage of that particular uh, uh, nucleic acid amplification test is that it uh, requires very little sputum processing. Um, and so that it's a very useful and easily performed test, uh, but isn't available in the U.S. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, we have a third call. Is is that everything, Catherine? Are you good? Good answer. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with the comments. Okay. Let's let's move on to. We have a third phone call. Um, and our next question comes from line of Elizabeth Grizzard with. Alexandria Health Department. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you very much. It was concerning case number three. I just don't know this. It sounded like you had to do the nucleic acid amplification test right away that night at the lab. Can, couldn't they have just kept the specimen for the next day and done it? Why they have to get another specimen for that? Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, Kevin, that's a good question. So uh, it was midnight <laughs> on a Friday night. So. Um, you know, the, I think once they have processed the specimen to, to look at, uh, at least our lab, they, they don't have something uh, available then to send to the state, which is where we have the NAT testing done. So they always require us to, to collect an additional specimen. I don't know if that's true at other places still at your institute. Or well, the, they still have to be able to, to, to amplify the DNA even in a processed specimen. Whether they actually would agree to do it or not, I don't know. but. Uh, uh, that it, it is feasible to technically feasible to do. Yeah, one would think so, and this is a problem perhaps at our just at our institute, but I, I think it might be elsewhere as well. I, I think it's just the lab and their uh, process and their their flow of uh, or their specimen flow, and once they've got something in one place, it's hard to redirect it to another. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to have a short break for, for uh, instructions again from the operator. Why don't you go ahead? Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, you may press 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone if you'd like to register for a question. And we do have a question here. It comes from the line of Jeff Sharp with the Arizona Department of Corrections. Please go ahead with your question. Hello. Thank you for uh, presenting this for us. These are four easy ones, I hope. Uh, with the one case where you had the two diagnoses, first the TB and then the cancer, um, why wouldn't you do a biopsy along with your initial bronchoscopy? Next question is when you have a single isolated lesion, like the cavitated lesion, I think that was case three, I'm not sure, um, why wouldn't you just get a chest cutter to remove the lesion? It would be both therapeutic and diagnostic. The third question is, I have no idea what a NAT test is. And third, fourth is, 
B-A-L. I'm not sure what that stands for. Probably the bronchial washings, but if you could clarify. Thank you. All right. Well, yes, B-A-L is bronchoalveolar lavage. It's one of the procedures you do with a bronchoscopy where you wash fluid into a segment on the lung and pull back a sample. Um, let's go to your, your first, we'll back up to your first question. So, so in the TB and cancer uh, case, why not at the time, uh, or, or actually, this is actually, there wasn't a BAL in your case. Um, yes, there was. So why not do a biopsy at the time? There, there was a biopsy. I, I'm sorry, Jeff, do you mean in the case, which, which case do you mean? Well, the case that had the active TB and then didn't, didn't treat, he didn't respond very well, and then you found the cancer. Why wasn't a biopsy done with the first bronch, since it was a, a, you know, a nodular kind of a lesion? So he had only one bronchoscopy that was at basically at seven months after treatment was started when he came back after having disappeared for three months. And a bronchoscopy was done, and both the BAL, the bronchoalveolar lavage, and a transbronchial lung biopsy uh, were done at that time. I think a... Well, just in standard operating procedure, then, when you do a bronch with this differential diagnosis, do you do the washings and cultures and a biopsy all at once? Usually, yes. Thank you. Okay, and then... I think the second question is also very interesting, which is with such an isolated lesion and with max diagnosis and not a lot of disease in the rest of the lung, uh, what is the role of surgery, Kevin? Uh, well, I mean, surgery is something I always try to avoid unless I think it's the benefit outweighs the, uh, the cost. And certainly pulmonary surgery can be... A uh, pretty big deal if it particularly has to be, be uh, done through an open uh, thoracotomy. And particularly in patients who are old and have a lot of comorbidities and they may have underlying emphysema and other uh, bad lung conditions, a lot of these folks aren't really good candidates for surgery to begin with. Um, certainly if this person has a resectable lung cancer and it's uh, deemed in their best interest uh, to go forward with that, then, then if that's the right therapy for that cancer, then that's, that's the way to go. Um, so it's not something that probably you do um, right up front. I mean, certainly you need to um, decide what type of cancer this is and uh, clarify whether it has spread uh, beyond that uh, single foci uh, and, you know, then stratify the patient's uh, risk-benefit uh, ratio with regards to, to, to therapy or surgical therapy. I, I think that before the development of or at least the recognition of what constituted an effective drug regimen for mycobacterium avium, that surgery in localized disease was, was much more common. But nowadays, uh, with the, the more potent macrolides, uh, chemotherapy is pretty effective and uh, is accomplished without uh, using major toxic agents and uh, therapy that's, that's not well tolerated. So I think there's a difference now compared with uh, the old days when there wasn't effective chemotherapy. All right, and Lisa, would you like, can you do a one-liner on what a NAT test is? The NAT is N-A-A-T, and it stands for Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, and uh, there are a number of them. The, gen, the, the gene expert uses it, the gen probe. MTD test is, is one of these tests, and it's basically these are PCR um, polymerase chain reaction based uh, tests that amplify um, segments of the DNA of you know of the of the TB organism so that you can uh, detect you know to increase the amount so that you can detect them. Um, so these are again molecular based tests um, that can be done on direct clinical specimens, sort of bypassing the uh, culture phase to identify MTP complex. So right, it tells you that the organism is there. It does not really tell us the viability of the organism, whether it's live or dead at the time. But it is that's a, an excellent point. That's an excellent point, Lisa, that, that it, it you know it will also be positive if all you're seeing are, are non viable organisms. 
just a fast way to know that the bacteria's DNA is there. Um, there just, I know that there's probably about 25 or more written questions. Um, there is another phone call. I want to point out that I know that we're using a lot of acronyms and shorthand um, uh, versions in this talk, and, and someone is just asking, what's TNF? And tumor necrosis factor uh, uh, is another acronym that we have in here. Um, can we move on to the next phone question, please? Our next question comes from the line of Marianne Matsu from the Tuberculosis Control City of Houston. Please go ahead with your question. I'm calling from Texas, 100 degree weather, but um, my question is, yes, yeah, QFT or Quantiferum Gold, do you use that test uh, as a tool? Well, so maybe I, I'm turning to Phil because he's sitting next to me. So in this case, a, a gamma interferon release assay um, here, quantiferon in the question, but certainly you can have an E spot uh, as a different one. Is this helpful at all in a differential diagnosis situation? Well, the the, uh, the EGRAS, the interferon gamma release assays, are useful particularly because they do not cross react uh, with uh, Mycobacterium uh, bovis or BCG infection. And uh, <clears throat> uh, and likewise, uh, have very slight cross-reactivity with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So the, the response is much more specific with infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's, it provides a little bit of weight in favor of a tuberculosis diagnosis when you're evaluating somebody uh, like any of the cases that we presented. Uh, but is far from definitive, and uh, it's like it, it's not really any more valuable than the tuberculin skin test in trying to make a diagnosis of tuberculosis. Basically, it has uh, limited uh, utility uh, in, in actually uh, making a diagnosis. You have to find the organism or histology or DNA uh, consistent with the, the diagnosis in order to actually make the diagnosis. And unfortunately, what often happens is that the patients who are sickest with TB are also the ones who are likely to have a false negative skin test as well as a false negative quantiferon. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's Kevin, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I, a lot of, it seems that a lot of clinicians very reflexively get a skin test or an IGRA done and uh, really are placed quite a bit of importance on it in the context of diagnosing it to TB. But I, I agree exactly with Phil and um, Gisela that I, I don't find there's much utility uh, to doing that for the reasons uh, they just discussed. All right. Well, and actually there is a written question from Temple Parsons, Kevin, that I think you just answered the question. Um, it was around case three. Again, would an IGRA test help to differentiate between active TB or active NTM? And I think your answer was it doesn't help you in active Oh, I mean, you're right. It, it helps clarify whether they've been exposed to TB previously, uh, but it doesn't necessarily help you uh, nail the diagnosis of what's going on now uh, down. And as Phil said, you've, you've really got to rely on the specimens you've collected and go after the right specimens to uh, either grow or at least molecularly confirm the presence of uh, TB. Thank you. I think we have one another uh, phone question. Go ahead. Our next question comes from the line of Sarah Burr with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Please go ahead with your question. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a question with regards to the role of, of bronch, uh, bronching patients when working up TB. It seems like increasingly our inmates are being bronched as part of the workup. And um, when is it appropriate? When is it not appropriate? Well, I'm looking at our other pulmonologists still. Now, I like to bronch, but I don't necessarily think you need it for all the TB cases. What do you think? Well, it's kind of fun to do, but um, no, I mean, 
Obviously, the vast majority of patients with tuberculosis are diagnosed based on uh, sputum examination uh, with smears and, and cultures, and particularly with the availability of uh, rapid molecular tests, uh, the diagnosis may be established much more quickly. Uh, bronchoscopy is useful when as in the patient that I presented, there's concern that a given lesion or abnormality or illness may in fact not be TB but be cancer. Uh, in this patient, I wouldn't have bronchoscoped the patient at the outset. He had a positive smear, and I would have been happy with that diagnosis. Uh, I probably would have bronchoscoped him later on when he didn't respond appropriately and the sputum smears had converted, uh, yet he had... Uh, uh, either stable or worsening uh, lesion on, on chest x-ray. Uh, at that point, I think bronch probably would have been appropriate. Uh, in that patient, um, um, it may have been uh, more suitable to do a, a fine needle aspiration than uh, bronchoscopy with biopsy, although there is uh, some reluctance to do uh, uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy and, and cavitary lesions. So probably thinking about it, bronchoscopy would have been the best way to go with him, and I would have done it earlier than was done uh, in, in this case. So um, if you can make a diagnosis with something short of bronchoscopy, uh, as is usually the case, fine. If not, bronch is a useful tool. Uh, I might add that there there are pretty good data substantiating that uh, bronchoscopy does add to the diagnostic uh, sensitivity of evaluations for uh, miliary disease. Uh, both bronchoscopy with BAL and transbronchial biopsy uh, getting actual lung tissue. I think those are really you know, very good points, Phil. It's usually when you're thinking about something else that, that, that with a bronchoscopy is particularly useful. Um, but uh, I wanted to put in a word, too, for post-bronchoscopy specimens because oftentimes bronchoscopy is done. You've gotten three negative smears on sputum, which we know 40% of, uh, you know, patients are smear negative who subsequently grow TB. Um, and then bronchoscopy is done very frequently. Post-bronchoscopy, if you get a sputum at that point, it will be positive. Well, great. I think there are no more phone calls, so we have a, a, a lot of um, written questions. Um, let's just throw a fast one out to Kevin, because the question was, if you have a um, patient with NTM, I'm guessing Beverly Gray is asking, how long do you continue standard for drug TB treatment um, when you have I'm presuming also a diagnosis of NTM. Does that um, does that alter your treatment for TB if you had concomitant NTM? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think in, I think about this in two ways. One is you have the patient who you uh, isolate TB and the NTM concurrently. At the end of my talk, we were talking about that patient, and it, usually, as we discussed. That NTM is really not of clinical significance. It usually goes away when you start treating their TB. And the, the reason is, is that they have TB, and as Phil said, uh, NTM and other saprophytic organisms can just, you know, you breathe them in and they get stuck in whatever abnormality is going on in the lung. They're not actually causing disease. They're just hanging out. The other situation is someone uh, like the patient I discussed who we um, – is a TB suspect, and you have to sort out whether it's TB and NTM, and you may, in fact, put them on empiric TB therapy prior to figuring that out. Um, then you kind of end up in the situation where you did with Gisela's case in terms of you've started empiric therapy, you don't have a diagnosis yet. You know, how long do you continue their empiric therapy after you make a diagnosis? So in her case, of course, COXI was made as the diagnosis. They chose to continue the TB therapy anyway. You know, I would have stopped it. There's no right answer there. Um, in my case, you know, say that we isolated uh, MAI uh, and we had put on empiric therapy, you know, for me, this I kind of go back to that um, 
the, the predictive value diagram I showed you, I mean, this is a woman who's over 50. She's a smoker. She's uh, never been out of the U.S. She has MAI. She meets the case definition for pulmonary NTM. You know, if I had had her on empiric TB therapy, I probably would have stopped it because I think it's very unlikely she had TB. Um, you know, if, if the situation was different, she was under 50, she was born in the Philippines, um, you know, she had significant TB risk factors. I'm, you know, I may in fact have uh, kept her on her TB therapy while I ruled her out. But again, as Phil mentioned earlier, um, most pulmonary disease is due to microbacterium avium, and at least two of your standard four drug um, agents against TB have good activity against microbacterium avium. Uh, so the therapy uh, initially isn't a whole lot different, um, and you could easily, in our case, add, have added azithromycin or clorithromycin uh, to that type of regimen, and then she'd be covered for both until her TB cultures turned out negative. Great. Any other comments from our faculty on that? It is a little bit more complicated uh, question, depending on on uh, do you mean that the case has uh, dual infections or is it in the interim while you're waiting to decide what the actual your actual culture results are? Um, no comments, Gisela? Well, I think you've you've expressed it right there. You are you're, you're in a situation where you do have to make a judgment as to. Um, in the face of no definitive evidence for TB and some evidence for a different diagnosis, is TB still enough of an issue that you want to cover it until your cultures come back negative? Um, certainly if it's from foreign born from a very highly endemic country, um, you know, perhaps other risk factors for TB that one would, might consider that. Now, uh, Gisela, there are a couple of questions that just, I think our last one that we can squeeze in uh, for the end. Um, you mentioned a false negative uh, NAT test and inhibitors, and I think people were wondering if you could um, clarify how the inhibitors uh, work mm -hmm. there. Um, sure. Um, it's, it's sometimes a, a person's natural sputum has uh, inhibitors within it that will inhibit the, uh, the polymerase chain reaction that's present in the NAT test. And so one can check for those inhibitors and the kits that are given out with the MTD gen probe test, you know, you know, do have that step involved with it. Because if you're, you, if inhibitors are present and you get a negative NAT, um, that you, you don't know whether it's negative because it's not TB or it's negative because inhibitors are there. And that happens, Phil, maybe correct me on this, um, up to 5% of the time. Yeah, it's not very common. I, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but it's yeah. not very common in species. It's right. not common in blood or other specimens. Right. So I think, and again, it's it's something that is that should be checked for, but um, and it, it's just a little caveat that you know if, if you get an unexpected negative test, you know, send another specimen. It might come back positive too. All right. Well, great. Thank you all. Really, been uh, interesting conversations, interesting cases. I think we just have a last little bit of information from Kelly. Um, and uh, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, great. This concludes today's web-based training, and we'd like to remind you to please remember to complete our evaluation, and we will email you the web link to the evaluation right away. If for any reason you have not been receiving our correspondence by email, please contact Bob Steedlecon soon. And this is our contact information. Thank you all, and goodbye. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation.